Hello, everyone, and welcome to AISC's live webinar, Towards an Integrated Fracture Control Plan for Steel Bridges, presented today by Dr. Robert Connor. Today is April 23, 2019. And my name is Brent Liu, I'm with AISC, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Robert J. Connor. Dr. Connor is the director of the Esprite Center at Purdue University and is the recently named Jack and Kay Hockema Professor in Civil Engineering. He has been working in the area of fatigue, fracture, and other performance and durability issues related to steel bridges for over two decades. Dr. Connor has been the principal investigator on a number of NCHRP projects, having successfully completed five uh, projects as principal investigator and three as co-principal investigator. He is the recipient of the George S. Richardson Medal in 2016. He received an AISC Special Achievement Award in 2012 and was the first recipient of the Robert J. Dexter Memorial Lecture Award in 2005. And in 2018, he was selected by AISC to receive the T.R. Higgins Lectureship Award. Today's presentation is his T.R. Higgins Lecture towards an Integrated Fracture Control Plan of Steel Bridges. Rob, thank you for presenting today, and I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate it. Well, uh, just uh, first, I, I want to apologize uh, for the reschedule. Um, I had lost my voice that day, and uh, it would not have been a fun thing for anybody, uh, you as well as me. So I appreciate people's patience in allowing, uh, allowing us to reschedule. And I also want to acknowledge AISC for the uh, T.R. Higgins uh, Lecture Award. This is uh, clearly one of the greatest honors of my career and uh, the opportunity to present uh, kind of a body of research and where we're headed on this specific topic of, of fractured critical bridges. So with that, we'll get right into our presentation today. Kind of like to set the stage. Uh, how did we get to where we got um, some things to talk about and uh, look at different perspectives? So. I think one of the things that uh, we have to keep in mind as we look at the concept or this family of bridges uh, with fracture critical members, commonly referred to as fracture critical bridges, first thing to keep in mind is their performance is, is excellent. Um, there's been a number of uh, failures, a very small number, uh, but overall the performance has been excellent. And it's an interesting statement because you can kind of break it into parts. The first part, we rarely have fractures, right? Um, and, and that statement can even be broken down. As you may know, prior to the 1960s and really the mid-1970s when the work at, at Lehigh that John Fisher did got into the specifications, we had bridges, uh, and they still are out there, that were never designed for the fatigue limit state, right? Those provisions were not in the uh, AASHTO or ASHO specifications. And so we know fatigue cracks are what lead to bigger cracks that can lead to fractures. So we have bridges out there. They're performing quite well, never designed for fatigue. There's a family of bridges built prior to what we have, as we refer to as the fracture control plan. And prior to that, you know, the takeaway is we didn't really have any material toughness specifications. So in the 60s, say, um, bridges didn't ha have to meet any CVN requirements necessarily. The welding, uh, all the wonderful things we've learned about welding weren't really in place in terms of fabrication. Those bridges are doing quite well. And then if you advance to, say, oh, the mid-1980s or so, late 1970s, when the fracture control plan, kind of as we know it today, kind of came online, um, we can't find anywhere in the literature where there's ever been a fracture in a bridge built to what I'll call our modern fracture control plan, including fatigue design and, and everything that goes with that. And so that's pretty impressive, right, that, you know, bridges that really no one thought about these limit states, there really are very few problems. And then once it was addressed, the problem seemed to go away entirely. Now, fracture critical is comprised of two words, right? There is the fracture part. That's the first thing I talked about in item one, but item two is the, the critical part, right? That it's critical because if something bad happens, well, the outcome is assumed to be bad, right? These are non-redundant members. And, and there's really only two bridges that you can find in the literature where there was really catastrophic failure. The first one, we'll talk a little bit more about the Silver Bridge. Uh, and the other one, sometimes it's cited as the Mianus River Bridge, the one up in Connecticut uh, where the pin and hanger system, the hanger was pushed off of the pin due to some corrosion issues. Um, not really a pure fatigue and fracture issue of itself, but a non-redundant member that uh, failed. And, and you would argue, you know, reasonably that they are fracture critical components. If something failed, there would be a bad outcome. Now, sometimes people will say, say I-35, 
That was a gusset plate issue, right? That was a design issue. Uh, there was no evidence of fatigue cracking related to the failure or fracture. Um, and so we have to be careful when we start pointing at structures. By far, the majority of non-redundant bridges where there was a catastrophic fracture, um, the outcome wasn't catastrophic, right? The bridge sagged or even carried traffic for a period of time, as we know. The other thing is, despite this, We've reacted very strongly, and, and that's appropriate at times. So when there's something that goes wrong as an engineering community, we need to react. We want to make sure it doesn't happen. But sometimes if we look at how we've reacted, maybe it was quite strong. Because fracture critical systems, right, they get that label, but really they're non-redundant is how they're viewed. And as we'll see, they're actually quite redundant at times, despite what we call them. Um, you know, eliminates the use of some very graceful, efficient structural systems. You know, the tight arch there on the left, I think, is a very nice-looking structure. Um, it's fracture critical, doing quite well. Uh, the bridge on the right, two girder systems, and, you know, they're not the solution in every case, but in the case that they are, we kind of shy away from those simply because of this name. And if you think about other industries and how they view this, well, they've kind of engineered the problem. For example, you may fly, and the question is, do you fly on that plane on the left uh, because more wings are better than two? Well, no, you know, you fly across the uh, Atlantic Ocean on that plane on the right. And, and so the question is, well, how did they figure this out? What have they done? And, and if you happen to be taking notes today, there's a phrase that you can use uh, how they did this. It's called um, engineering, right, where we can engineer limit states, and, and that's what's done. Because, see, on the aircraft on the right, the consequence of the failure of a wing at 37,000 feet is always, always, always bad. But somehow that industry has figured out how to make the likelihood of that event very, very, very small so that the overall risk is acceptable. And so we'll talk more about that. And then, you know, kind of jokingly, but, but the term fracture critical member or fracture critical bridge really is just a bad name. But very often in the engineering community, I think what, what we see is that because we call it fracture critical, there's this kind of presumption that it's going to happen. It's fracture critical. You know, if there's four girders in the cross section or two, the likelihood of fracture is no greater, right? If there's two compared to four, the, the bridge doesn't know, the girder doesn't know. And so when we engineer a likelihood associated, say, with an event happening, you know, it's no more likely if there's more girders. And so I kind of jokingly say it's a good thing the bridge doesn't know that we call it fracture critical because then something bad would happen, right? But that's not the case. Now, if we look at our current fracture control plan, um, it, it, it's, it is fragmented, not criticizing the approach because if you think about, again, where it came from, it came from there was a problem and the problem was addressed. And that's, that's how we handle things. That's appropriate. But as we move forward, Maybe we could uh, defragment it, right? We could kind of link some things. In other words, in the concept of an integrated fracture control plan in 2019, with all the knowledge that we have, we could begin to say, you know, well, I can make up for a shortcoming in one area with a strength in another. That's what integration allows us to do. We do it all the time. And the best way to illustrate it is the 24-month interval that by law we are required to do for bridges deemed to be fracture critical or having fracture critical members um, you know, does anybody know where that came from? Well, it, it came from, you know, the finger to the wind approach, right? That we knew something had to be done. 12 months is too often. 10 years is too long. So 24 months kind of appeared. And although it appears to be serving well, you know, the fundamental question is, well, what if something happened right after the inspector left? We sort of presume that the bridge would be okay uh, until, you know, I guess, 24 months in a day, right, until we come back. But there's no data to suggest that's appropriate. But maybe we could calculate inspection intervals and, and rationally integrate various components to control fracture. The other aspect is if you think about when the fracture control plan came online, say in the 1970s, and then you look again in, in 2019, let's say, um, we've learned a lot. We do a lot of things different. We have a lot of better material but nothing has changed. We treat all the bridges the same. Illustratively, if you were to have a 50s field welded, most people would go, ooh, field welded, I don't like that. 
right? If we have a field welded bridge with a lot of truck traffic and E prime details, and remember in the 50s, no one knew the term E prime details, right? Because we didn't design that bridge for fatigue and we don't know the toughness. Unfortunately though, by law, we're kind of required to treat that bridge the same as the bridge maybe that opened this morning uh, with high performance steel, right? The stop the hammer steels that are incredibly tough. Um, highly fatigue resistant details, maybe category C or even B or better on the bridge and designed for infinite life, built with, to the fracture control plant. And maybe if we look at the loading side, it only is an HOV bridge, high occupancy vehicles. Are they really the same bridge? Would you want them treated the same way? Well, no, of course not, right? Again, illustratively, that's like saying these two locomotives are the same. Well, the technology is completely different. Their capabilities are completely different. Their maintenance requirements are different. Another way to think of this is with healthcare, right? Should the 18-year-old ha have the same healthcare as maybe the 70-year-old? And, and let me put a caveat on it. By the way, the 70-year-old uh, doesn't have the best health record. Maybe everyone in their family died of a certain disease. Maybe they're overweight, they smoke, their favorite food is Twinkies and their favorite beverage is not you know, pure spring water, but maybe whiskey. In other words, there's characteristics at times we can look at and say, you know, I would treat the healthcare differently for that individual because what I know. We can't do that today. But in an integrated approach, you would. You would take into consideration these things. In fact, if you look at every aspect of really bridge engineering, but if we focus on steel bridge engineering and even drill down into this idea of fracture critical, if I say the 60s to even the 2000s, right? I'm not saying 2019, you know, you go back late 90s or 2000s, you know, nonlinear analysis is very common today, certainly for certain applications. We understand distortion fatigue, our fracture control plan, you name it, we've made advances. Yet we don't treat those structures different in their long-term performance, how they're treated in terms of legacy. Maybe another way to view then versus now is to consider what's happened in the past, how we reacted, do we do those things anymore? In other words, what did we learn? And the big question is this arm's length inspection every 24 months, that's very expensive, right? Would it make a difference if we look at what's happened in the past? So let's look at a couple of case studies. The first one, the Silver Bridge, right? It's the one I started with earlier. That's the very famous collapse of the I-bar suspension bridge, right? We all are probably familiar with this. If you're an inspector, you've seen this one, and it still gets cited all the time. In fact, just about every health monitoring paper will cite this bridge as a bridge where there was a collapse. But let's dig into it a little bit. Remember, this was the I-bar with the small defect down near the pin, about the size of maybe half of your pinky nail. Non-detectable down inside between eye bars, right? So let's ask the question, do we do this anymore? Well, we don't build bridges with eye bars. We don't build them out of steel, if you know anything about this steel, if you put it in boiling water, its impact energy was single digit toughness. We don't do that anymore. We don't allow those steels. Would inspection help? Well, as I indicated, it was down inside near the pin. And so, you could have an inspector doing visual inspection because that's what we do with the arm's length inspection, right? It's visual. You could have an inspector sitting at every joint on that bridge, and you know what would have happened? They would have rode it down into the Ohio River. It wouldn't have made a difference. But we don't do that anymore. Neville Island is another one, and these bridges aren't specific. They're, they're specific cases, but they're also kind of general reaction bridges. So the Neville Island Bridge, this is a two-girder bridge, Interstate 79 over the Ohio. Um, I guess the thing is don't build over the Ohio, right? But um, this is over the Ohio River, just kind of west of Pittsburgh. Two-girder bridge, there's the scale of the fracture, right? So these are big fractures and big two-girder bridges. And the, the failure was due to a repair weld problem. Now this had an electroslag weld in it, the old version of electroslag weld. And some of you might be saying, oh, well, yeah, there you go. But it wasn't the weld, it was the repair in the weld. And some of you know Carl Frank, and Carl will you know, live through this, and he explained it very nicely, that basically what happened is there was a spool change when the weld was made, and where the spool change occurred, there was a defect. Now, ironically, that defect really wasn't all that bad, but when they repaired the defect, they made a worse defect. And, and basically, the requirements on repair welds and some inspection weren't as tight as we have today. So do we allow that today? Well, of course not. Repair welds are treated very um, seriously. Uh, procedures have to be developed. Inspection requirements are quite high. So we don't allow that anymore. We learned from that. 
would field inspection of health. Well, no, this was a sudden pop-in fracture. The photo that I showed, if you, you could be literally looking at the girder, it looks fine, look down to look at your watch, look back up, uh, and the girder's broken in half. The person who found this, the story goes, was a tugboat captain. And so field inspection every 24 months would simply find the giant girder fracture. Lafayette Street, this is a bridge up in Minneapolis, has nothing to do with 35W. This is a two-girder bridge where there were some poor quality intersecting wells, as shown here, um, right in the location where the gusset. It's kind of similar to the Hone Bridge detail, uh, but it was a poor quality well that did have some evidence of fatigue cracking uh, that led to the fracture of this bridge, two-girder bridge. So do we allow that kind of detailing anymore? Well, of course not. We design for fatigue. We actually have details to prevent intersecting welds, and the quality of the welding would not be permitted today. Now, now maybe inspection would help in this case because there was some evidence of fatigue cracking. However, it didn't help. The fracture occurred before an inspector actually found the crack in the gusset plate, or at least maybe before there was a detectable crack by the inspector. So we don't do that anymore. Ah, the Hone Bridge. This is often one that folks cite, right? The constraint-induced fracture. This is representative of other fractures. There's been several of these, right? This is the three-girder bridge where the two girders that are circled have completely fractured, even the compression flange uh, on the girders. This is related to the special detail, right? The constraint-induced or CIF fracture details with intersecting welds and so forth. And without getting into that, Answering the fundamental question, do we allow those details today? Well, no. We have specific illustrative examples in the AASHTO LRFD to prevent that. We've had them for years. And so we don't allow those kinds of details anymore. Bridges that have those details should have been retrofit. Uh, Federal Highway issued a memo years ago uh, requiring that on non-redundant systems they're, they're retrofit. So we have effective ways to handle that. Would field inspection have helped? No. Again, these are sudden and pop-in fractures. Putting the fracture surface on these kinds of failures under the electron microscope reveals no evidence of fatigue cracking. So it's probably reasonable to conclude if you cannot find it with an electron microscope in the laboratory, you can't find it in the field, right? And then maybe a more recent one, obviously, is the Delaware River Bridge, right? This is the truss bridge over the Delaware River in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we have the fractured cord here, and uh, we can see just those two little darker areas on the cord where we have the fracture that occurred uh, due to uh, plug wells that were filled. Now, it's an insult, as Frank Russo says, to, to call these plug wells because these were hide holes. There were some mistrilled holes. They were filled with weld metal in a steel that was non-weldable. Now, you may ask, well, see, why would you have non-weldable steels? Well, it's supposed to be a riveted structure. And so we don't use those steels anymore. We don't allow plug wells. Fabricators know not to do that. They don't want to do that. They don't want to create those problems. And again, would field inspection help climbing around the bridge? Well, in this structure, uh, obviously not. It, it's suddenly fractured. But if you noticed in the picture, the, the paint was really good shape. This was found during an inspection of uh, the final inspection before some safe span was removed. The bridge was under construction, and people heard the fracture. Yet it wasn't even detected until people were up close and looking at it. So in all these cases, it kind of lends us to some conclusions. We don't do these things anymore based on the fracture control plan. And really, we might ask, what are we gaining from the field inspection? The other thing is, if you notice, in the four bridges, other than Silver Bridge, all the photos showed a fracture of a bridge in place. In other words, they did not collapse. And so the fracture critical, maybe not so critical. In fact, if we just look at the most recent example of the Delaware River Bridge, we estimate that the fracture occurred in mid-December. It was discovered in late January. We estimate the bridge carried interstate traffic uh, for you know four to six weeks. And so that shows that the bridge has some load carrying capability, which may lend you to ask the question, well, gee, what if I could think about that or calculate that? See, the bridges that stayed up, no one thought about that limit state, about redundancy. And so the objective of, a, of the projects that we've been able to do here at Purdue is to kind of rethink how we look at fracture critical. Because if we begin to think of the fracture limit state like any other limit state, the term goes away. And the best way to think of it is buckling critical, right? If you have a truss member, I'm sorry, a truss bridge, you have two kinds of members, right? Basically compression and tension. And so why don't we have buckling critical members? Why isn't the end post buckling critical requiring, you know, very special fabrication for out of uh, tolerance in terms of out of straightness and special inspection where we have to measure its geometry? Well, we believe our friends at SSRC, right, and AISC who've developed equations and have done a lot of research to do the design of those members. But for some reason, 
if we put it in tension, we kind of throw our hands up and say, hey, I don't know what to do. It, it could fracture. Well, maybe we can move past that. Maybe using state of the practice, not state of the art, state of the practice. Copy the homework of some other industries who treat fracture like a limit state. We can have very reliable tension members, right? Whether they're redundant or whether they're not redundant, that we can say that we can treat that limit state in a rational way. Because when we do that, the term goes away. But there's some other things to keep in mind. Many people believe, and, and rightly so, that we do inspection for safety. That's why we do it. But I have to ask the question, whose safety are we talking about? Because see, when we're thinking safety, we have to think about the public safety, which is generally who we're thinking about. But when we start closing lanes on interstate to put snoopers on bridges or lanes underneath bridges to gain access to get up close inspection, we're risking people's lives, both the inspectors and the publics. So we better have a good reason if we're going to cause the accident that's shown there in the photo, right? In other words, when we back up traffic, we had some problems here in Indiana on a bridge, and there were loss of life simply because the bridge was closed. There were some serious issues, and it was closed. But that traffic goes somewhere, whether it's closed for three weeks or three hours or a day. In Indiana, we had some issues where one of my colleagues here at Purdue did a study finding we're 24 times more likely after a short queue to have a serious accident. So we should ask the question, what safety are we talking about? And then there's another little part related to inspection that we often don't like to talk about, but I think we need to, called POD, or probability of detection. In other words, we go out and we inspect, and there's several hundred folks on the uh, call today. Well, let's say uh, we all went out to a bridge and we inspected it, and let's just say we're looking for cracks. Does anybody really think we would all come back with the exact same answer in terms of how many cracks we found? Um, well, we did a little study at Purdue where we took specimens, we put them up in the air, we put real fatigue cracks in them, and we ran real inspectors, 30, through. They knew they were being tested, uh, and we ran them through the course just trying to get a feel for what is their probability of detecting given fatigue cracks. This is what we found. And so I'll give you a second to digest this, um, but it is probability of detecting on the vertical axis the visible crack that's on the horizontal axis. And so, as you imagine, generally, as the crack gets more visible or longer, we're more likely to find it. But look at the statistics there in the uh, kind of right-hand side, the A50 crack, the 50-50 crack, right? 50% 50 of the time we would find or miss, it's about an inch. To get up to about a 90% probability of detection, we need about a five and a half inch crack. That's a healthy crack, and I want you to keep that number in mind. But you see some other funny things here, like notice the three individuals who the detection actually gets worse with crack length. Well, that's kind of concerning, isn't it? And, and, you know, you look at that data, and it turns out that in the case of why would that happen, well, one of the things that became apparent is it's kind of the more seasoned inspectors. And generally, we have this view, well, let's send Fred out, because Fred's been doing this for 30 years. Fred is good. Well, that's no guarantee of performance, right, just because someone has done it a long time. There's no guarantee that if someone finds small cracks, that they find all the small cracks. You look at the data, and if I go down to, say, the half-inch crack size, well, you know, there's, in the thick of the data, maybe 30% of the chance we'll find that. But there's also a high probability we'll miss it. Now, I want to be clear. I am not trying to criticize inspectors. Um, I've done bridge inspection in my previous career. It's hard work. But we have to be honest about what we're asking these folks to do with limited budgets, limited access, under the pressures of inspection and recognize that we see this variability in inspection. But see, in an integrated fracture control plan, we can address this because we can ensure that the tolerance of the member can recognize or reflect what the inspector can do. See, if we can integrate it, then we can deal with this part of the inspection process or this weakness, as I said earlier. See, the risk-based approach would probably be a better way to go. Risk is likelihood and consequence. So in terms of the likelihood of a fracture, if we could start thinking this way, well, those are things I can control, right? I can have very tough material. I can use really good details, right? I don't use details prone to brittle fracture. I can have low fatigue stress ranges, right? I can do all that in design. And so I can make the likelihood of the event very small. Now, the consequence, that's presuming it happens, 
presuming, say, a fracture occurs, no matter how unlikely, what's the consequence? Well, that's, you know, the things like collapse, loss of service, and so forth. You can put what you want in there, but that's consequence. Today, if I say a two-girder bridge exists, generally we just automatically say it's high consequence. We don't even think about it. We just say it's high consequence. And I would submit that most engineers actually do that little thing I said earlier where we can kind of confuse the likelihood and consequence. And we say, well, it's a two-girder bridge, so it's probably going to fracture because it knows it's fracture critical. We kind of put it up in the high risk because it's also likely. But that's not true. We shouldn't do that. But it's, we would put consequence there. Well, in the absence of any engineering, I guess that's reasonable to do. But let's say you could do some analysis and be able to conclude that, you know, if I lose that girder, it's not so bad. And there's some established procedure with an established load combination and so forth that everyone agreed to that the risk associated with it could be low to moderate because if it happens, it's not so bad. But remember, it's 2019. And I can select steels that are very tough, have infinite fatigue life and good detailing to make the likelihood of that event also very small. It's low risk or highly reliable. And that's where we need to get to. And I think we can get there today just by doing what we're doing to a certain extent. And so really what I'll talk about is ways to address the concerns without fracture or a fracture critical without adding girder lines. There's other ways to do this. And so I'll talk about two projects in general, uh, in a little more detail rather. Uh, TPF 253, a pooled fund study that is completed on internal redundancy and a recently completed NCHRP project, 883 is the report you can download. Now there was another project we did uh, looking at the high toughness steel, the stop the hammer steels, where you take a Sharpie specimen about the size of your pinky, put it at minus 60 at the service temperature, and it stops the hammer. And we'd like to see that even get exploited and uh, be able to be taken advantage of. But right now, we're not at that point yet, but there's two projects I'll focus on on how to treat this. And I'll focus on twin tub girders just to give you a flavor of what you can do with some system analysis. So member level redundancy or internally redundant members. These are the traditional, we think of old trusses and built up riveted girders where the bridge or the component rather is made up of a lot of little components. Now we know they consist of these little pieces and the thought is that maybe if one of them were to break, I don't have a direct crack path or a path for the fracture to run to take out the entire member. In fact, most other industries know this and take advantage of it. Aircraft people do this. Uh, there's been work here at Purdue that some of my colleagues have done uh, on the early uh, research on the Airbus A380 fuselage where multiple components were introduced, some with intentional cracks, to demonstrate that if one of those fails, the entire fuselage doesn't fail. It's built out of a number of components. Now, on highway and railway bridges, we kind of know it's there, but we don't take advantage of it because there's never really been any explicit research looking at it. Now, why do we know it's there? Well, if we kind of look at performance, if I just pick a structure here, this uh, Steve Lovejoy out in Oregon shared this with us. Uh, this is a two-girder bridge, and it is in what I'm going to refer to today as the faulted state, where there's a component broken or a girder broken. It looks pretty good, right? It's not, uh, you know, not sagging or anything. And if you look closer, uh, you would find that one of the angles is completely severed. This was found during an inspection, and which means the bridge was able to carry traffic in this condition. And there's other examples of this in the literature or that owners have. Maybe one of the best examples is a project we had the privilege of doing here in Indiana um, on the Milton Madison Bridge. Uh, if we look at this uh, bridge um, and we take a, a view, that lower cord right there, what we ended up doing is severing it with shape charges, but we severed it in stages. It's a built up lower cord and we partially severed it. And so the photo here kind of shows that. Now, half of the lower cord is actually internally redundant. It's two angles and two plates, but we cut it entirely. We cut half of it to see, well, what would happen if we cut half of this member, say that fractured somehow? Well, obviously, this is in the faulted state. The photo is looking up at the bridge, and it demonstrates that the member can be internally redundant, that the fracture can't jump from member to member. Now, incidentally, we also uh, extended the test and cut the other half of this cord. And, you know, when I do this in person, I'll ask people, you know, well, what do you think happened? And generally people will say, oh, it collapsed, or maybe it just about collapsed. In the faulted state with the entire cord cut with about um, 300,000 pounds of sand focused in the middle panel points, the bridge sagged an additional three-eighths of an inch. And so the system performance kicked in, which I'll talk about a little bit later. 
But there's two forms of redundancy, internal redundancy and system analysis. Now, again, focusing on the internal, basically the concept is this. How do I assess the effect if I lose that lower cover plate? Are there cases when I would lose all my load carrying capacity, or is there some target load that I should be able to achieve, both dead and live? Once I failed that component, though, the question is, while it may survive, how long would it survive? And so I need to think about its fatigue life, really, right, in the faulted state. How long until the next component fails or the member begins to unzip? So if I can show that I don't have an explosive failure when one thing fails, one component fails, how long will it last? And so that led to some very interesting tests and that were a lot of fun. Basically, the research did this. Build some full-scale and large-scale specimens, notch a component, say an angle or a cover plate, and the reason we would notch them is to get a really sharp, true fatigue crack. We don't care about initial fatigue life. That's well-documented, well-researched. We would then grow that crack to a critical length based on uh, fracture mechanics, and that required the girders to be cooled in some cases, but, but note the temperature, minus 120. And the warmest we tested was minus 60. That's zone three. We would get down to minus 120. Now you probably think, well, why? Why would you do that? Well, some of the steels we used were from old girders, so they were not so great. They would be tested at minus 60. But some of them were newer steels, and so they had more toughness. And so what we wanted to make sure was that all of the girders were tested when the fracture would occur, on what we're going to call lower shelf. In other words, single digit foot pounds. Now I referred to that, I used that phrase earlier, talking about the silver bridge, right? Bridge steels that were really, really brittle. Because what we didn't want to have is the girder's performance be criticized that, well, you had good steel. You had 80 foot pounds during the fracture. That's why the whole girder didn't fail. That wasn't the case. Everything was single digits. And so what we would do is we would notch the girder, we would grow it to a critical crack size, cool it, load it up, and nothing would happen. The fracture wouldn't jump. In fact, the individual plate wouldn't fracture. And so what we would need to do then is grow the crack more. We would repeat this test, which is very time consuming, and nothing would happen. In fact, we only had one girder where the component failed. And, and if you think about what's happening, as we learned, as we studied this, as the component begins to crack, it gets softer. And it begins to shed load to the uncracked components. Now that behavior is actually really good because what that means is the load in the member uh, begins to come out of it. But from a fracture point of view, if you want something to break, it's not a plate that's isolated, which is normally how we think of fracture tests. That led to some, uh, oh, maybe trying to be a little clever on how to get failures to occur. And what we needed to do and what we wanted were actually very little fracture, little cracks to become unstable, to fracture, to get the bang, so to speak. And you'll see a video later. Um, where the explosive fracture occurs. That led us to cooling the girder, notching the girder, getting a crack, cooling the girder, and then driving wedges into the crack. Obviously completely unrealistic, right? The girder is up at like point, you know, 55, 0.65 FY. It's at minus 110 degrees, and then we drive wedges into the crack. But that's what it took to get the fracture to occur and then evaluate could the girder explosively fail. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it's just to give you a feel for the scale of the specimens. These were, you know, 46-inch deep girders with multiple cover plates. These are big girders. In fact, the 36 and 46-inch deep series, in looking at railroad bridges with two girders, uh, for these span lengths, these would have sufficed as railroad bridges. So these are big girders. And so I want you to appreciate that, that these are little small-scale tests and when you see the, the video. And so what I'm going to do is kind of transfer over to a video, and I think Brent's going to help me out with this. Is that right? Uh, to play some of these. Yeah, and so, Rob. Yep. And so we'll show you a video of one of the tests here. Before we start that, Rob, uh, I just want to make an announcement that, that the, uh, the audio on this, there are sounds associated with the physical testing, nothing else. But if you want to hear that, you'll have to turn on the speakers on your computer. Uh, that audio will not come through the phone line. So, uh, again, okay. it's, just the, it's just the physical testing that you'd be hearing. All right. So I'm going to advance to the next slide here to – Try to share this video. That's the one specimen really that we can never fail to use. All the rest have the wet disease. So hopefully we're getting a really loud one. So 
the other thing you'll notice is there's actually very little deflection uh, because the stiffness of the girder doesn't change, right? The other thing you'll notice is the entire girder doesn't fracture, right? So the member appears to be internally redundant. Now, in this last specimen, the flange was actually an inch thick and the angles um, were about three quarters or five eighths. And so we thought, well, let's push the limit a little bit. Let's make a girder where the cover plate is an inch and a half thick, terribly proportioned. In fact, as we'll discuss, outside the limits of our specification. Let's see what this girder does. Again, even in a fully proportioned girder, um, we don't have any problems with fracture. And so I'm going to come back to PowerPoint here, hopefully. Oops. And share. And so then we moved into axially loaded members to simulate truss members. Uh, and here's the family of some of the specimens. Um, we even had one with a tack weld as shown there in item number five, and that was to, to kind of prove to ourselves that if a fracture ran through a tack weld, could it, could it take out the whole member, right? Is there enough of a, uh, a path for the fracture to occur? This required some very large fixturing. Uh, this was a fixture built in the Bone Laboratory. Uh, it's capable of uh, loading up to about 2.2 million pounds in axial tension. We also tested some lower cords. Uh, this was an actual lower cord from a bridge called the Winona Bridge in Minnesota. We were working with them. They're an Esprit partner. Uh, just to give you scale, the people that you see to the top of the photo, they're about 60 feet away from me where I'm taking this photo. So this is a long truss cord, a real truss cord, and where we're looking at all the secondary effects as well that uh, develop in, in specimens like this. Again, if you look at a cross-section of these specimens, um, you see how poorly proportioned they were. At this point in the research, we kind of got a little more risky, right? We knew that we had internal redundancy. And so we were kind of pushing the limit in the axial specimens. In fact, when that middle plate fails, the one and a half inch plate, as you'll see in the video, um, we're down, we've lost 66% of the area of the member. But as you'll see, the fractures don't jump. The other thing I want to bring out is, um, I guess I have to admit this, that in the built up flexural members as well as here, uh, we got kind of lazy. Uh, these are hard members to build. There's a lot of holes to drill, rivets to install at times. and So we reused components. And in the axial members, uh, the outer plates are redundancy plates, if you want to call them that, in this built-up member. We would reuse those. In the flexural members, they would be reused. And so they would go through multiple fatigue tests as well as fracture tests. Yet even in those worst case conditions, fractures did not jump. And so we'll also switch over to a video here. You'll hear loads being called out, but if you can't, these are at about a million pounds of load when they fail. So we'll just go to the video. So as we see, the same thing was observed, that the failures did not um, result in complete catastrophic failure of the component. <clears throat> Once you have all that experimental data, you can move into the finite element world with calibrated models based on all that data uh, to look at things that you can't look at in the laboratory, a whole large parametric study, all the local effects, and so forth. And so at the end of the day, after all of that work, What's the outcome? Well, I believe we've confirmed that if you stay within a box, you have certain member proportions and certain fatigue life requirements, you gain a property that we refer to as cross-boundary fracture resistance, that the fractures don't jump from component to component. And complete member failure is not a plausible limit state. The outcome is the 2018 guide specifications for internal redundancy of built-up members. This is really a game changer for the steel bridge industry because it allows us to now, in a codified way, evaluate such members. It treats axial and flexural as well as new and existing. So older truss bridges, older flexural members may meet the specification, allowing us to set 
the rational inspection interval. And that's really where the big payoff is, right? The legacy long-term inspection costs that we run into with these bridges is what we're really trying to rationalize. And so the implications are quite interesting. First of all, the traditional, as I would call it, the FCM inspection that the Code of Federal Regulations discusses is now replaced with another term that's in the CFRs called a special inspection. And the beauty of this is that it's in the CFRs. We don't need to change the law. All we are doing is redesignating the member and invoking a type of inspection that's already there. And if you notice, the terms that are underlined, ASHTO T18 actually came up with this concept. Let's use this type of inspection because it's in the law. If you think about what it's saying is, it's an inspection, inspection scheduled or at an interval that's at the discretion of the owner. Well, in the guide specs, you calculate that interval. It's used to monitor a particular owner suspected deficiency, a broken component, right? That's what we're looking for. And so the objective is defined and specified in the guide spec. But I want to emphasize, it doesn't have to be hands-on. It, it could be, it may need to be, but it doesn't have to be. Also, I want to emphasize, your routine inspections, right, things you're doing for corrosion potentially or, or concrete issues, you know, the deck, that goes on unaffected. We're not trying to say leave broken components in place, but it does allow us to treat the members in a rational way. In fact, in the specification, there are these tables where we specifically calculate remaining fatigue life in the faulted state. And then we move over and estimate or calculate an inspection interval. And, you know, I'm sure some people are saying, well, you know, fatigue life calcs, are, uh, they're questionable. Well, remember, safe life calcs for fatigue, there's only a 2.5% probability that the cracking would have occurred in the first place. Now notice when we come over to the interval itself, we put a safety factor on the already uh, two standard deviation fatigue life. So in other words, if you calculated a 18 year life, the, the longest interval for the special inspection would be nine years rounded up then to 10. So we have another safety factor, a very conservative approach. You also may be thinking that, well, bridges won't meet this. Well, a lot do. A lot of bridges, when we check them for fatigue, have long fatigue lives. Or it's a good application when instrumentation will pay off to get an idea of what's actually going on. The point is, it's an opportunity to set a rational inspection interval on existing members or newer members that are built up, maybe a bolted built up cross girder, for example. The advantages are quite obvious though, right? Because the objective of this inspection is now tailored. It's different than what we do. We've assumed what the broken or bad thing is we're looking for, a broken component, right? Not a small crack. Oh, and by the way, cracks form under the rivet heads on built up members, and they will always form as shown there, further away from the face you can see if you have multiple plates. It has to get out from under the rivet head for you to find it. So that's an important difference, right? See, we're not looking for the crack on the left, which I can give you the data, remember we talked about, that we miss, unfortunately. That's actually a specimen at the Esprit Center that inspectors missed, that crack. No, we're looking for the thing on the right, a broken component. And remember, the likelihood of finding that is very, very high. This, we think, is the first integrated fracture control plan, right? Because the interval that we calculate is tied to the duration or the member tolerance, both for strength and time, and the capability of the inspector. Everything is being linked together. It's a major advantage. Now, there's other things that we have to think about, right? For example, if we're going to do what's called system analysis, where we want to say that a two-girder bridge, if one of the girders completely fails, like in a welded member, well, you know, well, where should I put the fracture? Or a truss, right? How many members should I check? Well, it'd be nice to have guidance on that. Or what is failure in a member, say if I assume a cord in a truss fails? You know, the bridge is classified as having FCMs if this is the damage. Well, it'd be nice to have guidance. Or, or here's a big one, well, under what load? Is it the strength load or is it something less? And then when we say refined analysis, it's going to take a little more analysis than maybe Langer analysis. Well, how refined is refined analysis? It would be nice to codify that. And that was the objective of 1287A, which is now NCHRP Report 883. It's the first pass at trying to codify an approach, whether a member is really should be classified as an FCM or what Federal Highway already refers to as an SRM or system redundant member, a member that gains its redundancy through the performance of the system, and then turn that into ASHTO specifications. 
And again, it's important to recognize that this is a little different than the internal redundancy, at least at this stage in time. This literally takes it off the FCM list, which means you would no longer be required by law to do that interval. And so that's a pretty big statement, right, that I could maybe take a tight arch off the FCM list and that if something fails, like the entire tie maybe, it's quote unquote safe. So there should be some hurdles to jump in order to make that statement. That means the approach had to be able to cover a lot of different types of structures within the inventory, within reason. Um, the load model, how you do the analysis, the criteria have to be applicable to a lot of different structure types. Now that makes it challenging. That means this approach has to work with a 40-foot span two-girder bridge or a 400-foot span truss. And so it gets challenging, right, to make it that uh, applicable to that many structures. But we did our best, and now there are the AASHTO approved guide specifications for system evaluation. So there's a second guide specification, and again, in a lot of ways a game changer for the steel bridge industry, because now we have the first approach that's codified to try to set the level playing field of how we do the analysis, say, of that truss that's shown on the guide spec cover should one of those tension members fail. And I'll just give you an example of what this can do for you. The state of Wisconsin uh, worked with us. Uh, they found this very intriguing. They have a lot of twin tub girders. And they came to us and said, you know, we have a lot of these bridges. We close lanes on interstates. We do inspections at night. We make inspectors crawl through these things. But, but we think there's probably some redundancy here. Could you evaluate them? And so we ran these through the NCHRP criteria. The outcome, well, you can probably guess. I wouldn't be sharing it if it wasn't good for us, huh? They satisfied the NCHRP criteria. Okay, well, what does that mean? That means that they are not fracture critical members. They are SRMs. In other words, that the bridge has tremendous reserve strength in the faulted state and does not need to be inspected by people crawling through the girder looking for small cracks at a tack well or at a weld at a stiffener or looking at the outside looking for damage. No, it's an integrated fracture control plan because what are we looking for now? We're looking for an entirely fractured tub girder. The bridge can tolerate that. It's been deemed and shown to be able to do that. And what's really interesting here is that it's another integrated approach. So I don't need to be up close. I don't need to close lanes. Now, it is a complex analysis, but I think we're going to get to a point where we don't need to do that. And I'll just comment on that a little bit. And so some closing thoughts uh, on fracture critical. Hopefully, maybe some of the things we're moving forward with have uh, are gaining some traction and we can uh, you know, make this a rational thing, not just a, a, a site, you know, I look at it and there's two girders and I call it that. And so I think when we look forward of how we maybe should proceed as the steel industry, it's good to look back. Because if we look at the fracture control plan, even just if we stop there, those bridges are doing very well. We haven't had any fractures. And so that's in our favor. Modern fatigue design, modern fabrication, it's all doing good. And we have to recognize that in those 40 years, we made tremendous advances on all aspects. But really, the view of what's in FCM hasn't changed. Uh, I think we still have people thinking we're building the silver bridge. In fact, I think we still have to deal with this guy, right? The person who is living through those things in the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever. And no matter what we do, no matter how good the bridge is, the member, the fab, you name it, they still say it's two, of, two girders, it's fractured to critical. I think it's time to move past that. And the reason we deal with this person, the real big challenge, the biggest hurdle that we face, I think maybe you know, we can see it's, it's not an engineering issue. That's not our biggest challenge. It's the emotional factor that's tied up with fracture critical, right? Why don't we have buckling critical? Because we somehow are willing to believe that engineering. If we could get past our emotions and believe the engineering on tension members, I think we'd be a lot better off. You know, a lot of you are probably younger and maybe com competed in the steel bridge competition that we have. And I would ask you, every time you built a bridge, they're probably fracture critical. They're trusses or arches, very effective, graceful, or efficient, graceful structures. Well, why are we allowing that if they're fracture critical? Why would we ever encourage that? You know, those students, come out with great ideas and they maybe say to their supervisor, well, I'd, why don't we do a two-girder bridge? And they'll get laughed out of their office, right, because it's fracture critical. We need to get past that emotion. And so if I go back to the aircraft, you know, and kind of maybe close with that, we can fly across oceans safely, right? 
the risk associated with flight is low. The consequence is always high, no matter what we do. We lose one of those landing gear, we lose one of those wings, it's always high. So it's safe and acceptable because the likelihood is low. Well, if we compare it to what we do in modern steel bridges, let's take that same approach. The likelihood I think we've shown is low. We haven't had any fractures. And so the likelihood of fracture is very, very low. But the consequence can also be shown to be low. We can do things with internal redundancy. We can maybe do some analysis to show that, you know, it's not so bad if a girder fails. That also allows us, though, to prioritize, because then we can determine bridges that do need more attention from inspection. But if we can show the likelihood is low and the consequence is low, well, effectively what we're saying is, you know, we can fly on one wing. If I lose one of the girders and I can still carry the appropriate live load, we can fly on one wing. And so we can have very reliable and robust structures. And if you think about what we showed in the state of Wisconsin, those bridges are flying, or could fly, on one wing. Now the analysis is a bit complex, but where we're headed with tub girders as an industry is to not make it complex. Because see, why are four girder bridges non-fracture critical? Because we have a lot of experience with them. We have experience from impacts where trucks have taken out girders and the bridge stays up, it carries live load. Once we gain enough experience, say with twin tubs, and I think we're 95% of the way there, what we're working on are simplified checks we can make to say, you know, you don't need to do nonlinear finite element analysis. If you check this, this, and this in design and use your existing approaches for designing, say, twin tub girders, and you add these couple little checks, you're going to be out of the woods, and they will be deemed as non-fracture critical members. We'll probably get there with other configurations with times. And so with that, I will conclude and leave you with this closing thought, because I, I hope we'll get to this point someday down the road. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brent and for any questions we may have. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Um, we do have several questions from the audience and uh, we'll get to those in a moment. And just wanna remind you, if you do have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Connor, um, feel free to send that through the chat uh, right now. But first we've got a question for our audience. Um, this is a polling question, and uh, we ask you guys to participate, and let's see if uh, we followed along with today's lecture. So the question is, true or false, the AASHTO guide specifications for internal redundancy of mechanically fastened built-up steel members can be used to evaluate if a built-up member that is traditionally classified as an FCM uh, may be reclassified as an IRM. Is that true or false? I'll give you a second to think that over before we jump into the polling module. Again, there's a statement shown here on the slide, true or false? Okay, I'm gonna jump over to the polling module and you can click on the radio button for true or false and uh, we'll watch those results come in here. Give you about five more seconds if you want to vote. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, Rob. Okay. Looks like about 85% said that is true. What do you think, Rob? Uh, that's that's good. That's a good percentage. Um, the answer is true. Um, that you can. That's what they're intended to be used for. Now, maybe the people who said false. One of the reasons could be is right now. While, while you can classify that, it does not relieve you from the inspections, at least uh, today on April 23rd. Um, Federal Highway is in the process of developing a memo uh, that will be issued hopefully within a very short time here um, that will allow us to now use this to reclassify the member as an IRM and then set a, a rational inspection interval. So maybe there's some confusion on that because the memo has to be written. But the guide specs are accepted by AASHTO and uh, we could, you could use them today to at least uh, start the process. Okay, all right, let's get to some questions before we uh, wrap things up today. Um, just a couple clarifications on a couple terms you used. Um, first uh, question is, can you elaborate on the difference between state of the art and state of the practice? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's one of those funny subtlety things. Uh, but sometimes I think state of the art is more what we do in research. I guess um, you know people in terms of the general view or what my uh, view would be on it. The state of the art is you're right at the cutting edge. There's you know very few people could who could handle this kind of work. State of the practice is basically, in my view, and how I mean it in this context, of, of what we kind of do day to day. And so as an example, uh, the internal redundancy, um, that can be handled with an Excel spreadsheet. In fact, NSBA at the uh, Steel Bridge Conference, or uh, NASCC rather, released their first version of one of those spreadsheets for uh, axially loaded members, basically trust members. Most offices use Excel. Most people write Excel uh, uh, spreadsheets. And so that's not really state of the art to do that. That's kind of practice. That's what we do day to day. So that's kind of how I mean it. Okay. Um, and then, just in general, with your with the videos you showed today, um, someone just asked for clarification. Can you please explain what the dust is in the video? Um, so it depends on uh, which which video it was. So some of it is just like the the, the fracture, the bang is very very violent. Um, but I think what they're talking about is kind of the white looking dust falling down. The girders are so cold, um, they were enclosed in a like kind of like a clamshell. Uh, that's what they are co cooled in with liquid nitrogen. It takes about an hour or more to get them down to a uniform temperature. That is quickly removed. The camera starts, and when the fracture occurs in that short amount of time of maybe a couple minutes, the girder frosts over. And during the fracture event, the frost falls off, and that's probably the uh, dust uh, that, that the person is seeing. Okay. In fact, you can see steam kind of coming off the girder too, like a cold glass on a hot day. Okay, I'm going to move to slide 22. Mm -hmm. um, the question is this, how, how is it that a two-girder bridge um, can have the consequences labeled with a value of one. Sure. So what, it, what it's trying to illustrate is that, and this is where, you know, as an owner, you would have to determine that. But the consequence, generally what people view with a failure of one of those girders, when we say fracture critical, if you look at the definition, it's talking about collapse, right? Catastrophic failure, no load carrying capacity, something. Now, now you can put whatever you want in there. But if you go by the definition that it's going to lead to collapse, if, if the structure doesn't collapse and can carry, say, the load combinations that are in the AASHTO guide specifications, it's very difficult for me to say that there's collapse type consequence, right? There's certainly not going to be loss of life. Um, you could say there's some loss of service once you find it. And once you find it, you would react. We're not saying ever leave that in there. But it isn't going to be like the silver bridge, right? The idea that the definition, I mean, if, if you look in AWS D15 and you read through that of what the fracture control plan is intended for, and I would encourage everyone to do that, look at the commentary. That's what they had in mind, these truly non-redundant members. Today, people start calling every member in a, in a pedestrian bridge truss fracture critical, even compression members. They call compression flanges in two girder bridges fracture critical. That's not what it's intended for. It's very difficult then to say that if the bridge stays up, carries a reasonable, well thought through, reliability based load, that, that it's very high consequence. The point is you, you don't have to be in four all the time. So maybe somebody would say, well, I don't like one, I could go to two. But it isn't that really bad, bad consequence all the time. That's all it's trying to say illustratively in a simple way. Okay. All right. Um, just another clarification. What what does SRM stand for? You mentioned that. Sure. Yeah. So I um, I would encourage folks to Google uh, the Federal Highway Memo from 2012, from 2012, uh, where they gave additional guidance on fracture critical definitions uh, and so forth. In that memo, and now in the 2018 LRFD, Ashton LRFD, uh, an SRM is defined, and it stands for System redundant member. And it is intended to apply to these kinds of members where it's been shown that, you know, they're traditionally called fracture critical, but through analysis have been shown to be redundant. In other words, the bridge doesn't collapse, right? There's redundancy. Um, 
in, through analysis, they're shown to be redundant. And they gain their redundancy through the overall system behavior of the bridge. And so if you think about a, a, a two-girder bridge and you fail the girder and the bridge carries live load, well, well, why is that? Well, it's because it's not a girder by itself, right? It's, it's a system. It's a bridge with a composite deck and cross members. If you can show that that member doesn't result in collapse, it's failure, then it is determined to be redundant. Now, what that means is that in fabrication or in design, rather than labeling that as FCM, you know, like you would normally do on your plans, you would label that plate, that flange, that web, that whatever it is, as an SRM. And what that invokes is the Clause 12 of AWS D15. Clause 12 is the FCP. But it is intentionally not calling it an FCM. Because when you call it an FCM, by law, you have to do the arm's length inspection. This is permitted to do today. There's no further memo that needs to be written because the memo was written in 2012. And so you want all those good things in the FCP, but you don't need to do the arm's length inspection every two years, climbing around and looking for tiny cracks because you've shown that, say, in, with Wisconsin, for example, the tub can completely fail. And so in Wisconsin, those girders now would be labeled as SRMs, no longer FCMs. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. I'm going to jump to slide 27. Maybe 28 might be better for this one. But the question is, for a built-up member in which the initial fracture didn't jump to other components in the built-up member, the safety factor to fracture of one or more of the remaining components of the built-up members may be exceeded or more likely um, may be exceeded due to unanticipated loads, such as today's heavier vehicles. How is this type of member without true internal redundancy treated? Okay, that's a really good question. So the first point is um, in the photo, and this is a good photo to have up here. Um, the way the guide specification works is this. It, it, you as the engineer have to assume which component, so in the member that severed it, you would never assume the whole member that you could, but you would never assume the whole built-up member failed in this case. This is a, a multi-component truss member. You would assume one of the angles, one of the doubler plates, a cover plate, whatever fail. Now, there is a load combination called, there's two, there are two new load combinations for uh, evaluation, redundancy one and redundancy two. Redundancy two is effectively strength one at a reduced reliability. So you are checking strength one at a reliability depending on the member, uh, either one and a half or two and a half. And, and that's a little complicated to get into, but let's just say it's a two and a half. And so effectively you're still checking the heavy loads. It's the HL93, all lanes loaded, the whole thing, just at a different set of load factors. And so you're checking, does the remainder of the cross section carry that load? And that's the load combination then in the faulted state. Now, the guide specifications do point in the commentary to say if you feel that you should be checking permit loads, for example, then you're welcome to do that. You're not required to do that, but it's just like any existing bridge. You would check the, 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 uh, the condition of the bridge. When are you able to apply this? Because one of the questions that comes up, well, you know, why would it have failed in the first place? Well, generally it's presumed to be fatigue or something like that. But in order to use the guide specifications for, for internal redundant members, you have to have positive remaining fatigue life prior to conducting the evaluation. And what that's intended to avoid is what's called widespread fatigue damage. For example, if we look at that lower cord and we calculated that it had negative 10 years of life, the concern would be that there is a probability that there's cracks in any given one of those components, right, any plate or any angle. What you can't then say is like, well, if one of those fractures, and there's the bang, um, how do I know the others aren't going to let loose? They all have cracks in them. And you'd be absolutely right. So we don't allow that. You have to have positive remaining fatigue life. Again, you may think, well, that's not going to be possible on an old bridge. Well, it is. A lot of older bridges will have positive life. And I can tell you, if you put a few strain gauges on the bridge, you will find that, as many people know, right, the stresses are lower much lower, in fact, than what we calculate. And generally, every bridge I've ever instrumented on, you know, will have some extended fatigue life than what we did by the simple calculations. And so 
that's how we're able to do that. It's a, basically a strength evaluation, so that's nothing different than what you do, just a lower level of reliability that's, again, been hashed out and agreed upon. Um, and then you make sure you have remaining fatigue life. There's other guidance on the condition of the member, right? I'll exaggerate, but let's say there was a big corrosion hole in that lower cord. No, you can't use this, right? So there's certain condition that the members have to be in in order to use this. Okay, and you mentioned sensors there, uh, Rob. There's a couple of questions about sensors. Uh, one being, can you can a fracture be predicted with the use of sensors? And the other question is, should we be putting sensors on bridges to detect the growth of cracks? Um, I guess for both of those, I would say no. Um, you know, fractures occur, right? They just they go bang. Um, so you couldn't really detect it prior to it becoming unstable. At least I've never seen any evidence of a sensor that can say, hey, you know, it's going to fracture because by the time it would know it, it's going to fracture. You know, as you saw in those videos, I mean, these are, you know, it's through the girder in, you know, three ten thousandths of a second. Um, in terms of monitoring to, you know, uh, keep track of things, I, I, I'm not really a big fan of, you know, just throwing sensors all over everything uh, in order to, I think we need to, you know, I think we need to be intelligent about it. And so if you have a structure that you have specific concerns about and there is a sensor that can reliably um, alert you to the problem, then by all means that, that could be considered. But I think uh, the issue becomes the phrase of health monitoring. Because when we say health monitoring, many people just say, oh, okay, well, you're monitoring the health. And my first question is, define health. Because I may have the best sensor in the world to monitor your blood pressure. But unfortunately, Brent, you might have arthritis, and that affects your health. And I can't detect anything about that. And so we have to be smart, right? What are the problems? What's the sensor? And so just to say sensors to do things, maybe we'll get there someday with the tricorder, like from Star Trek. But uh, today, I, I'm not really big on just saying, let's put sensors everywhere. OK. Um... I know we're running over, but let's let's just try to grab a couple more here. Um, I'm going to go to slide 29. And the, and the question is, is why do we have to do these tests at minus 60 and some as cold as minus 120? Sure. Why isn't, why isn't the bridge tested at normal temperatures? Uh, excellent question. So in, in AASHTO, um, we have the, in, in the U.S., right, we have different temperature zones. So we have different... Uh, lower temperatures, right, that we design for, zone one, two, and three. A bridge in South Texas is treated differently from material requirements than a bridge in North Dakota. However, the reason we do that is because material toughness or its ability to tolerate uh, a fracture, to tolerate a crack, or to prevent a crack from initiating, say like in the case of a built-up member, one component fractures suddenly, there's the bang as you hopefully heard in the video, what we don't want is the second component to fracture. Well, its ability to tolerate that, that kind of dynamic loading, uh, its toughness drops with temperature. In other words, uh, I am better at, a, uh, at tolerating a crack at a warm temperature and higher toughness than at a cold temperature and lower toughness. And so the tests are done at cold service temperatures, right? If you have a bridge in North Dakota, you know, as we saw this year, uh, we can get down to some very cold temperatures, and a crack that maybe is stable in August is no longer stable in January. Now, the reason for the minus 60 is because that is the lowest anticipated service temperature in the U.S., in the northern states. So to be conservative, we tested everything as if it was in the worst location. The reason for the minus 120 is because our newer steels, fortunately, but unfortunately for me as a researcher, are quite tough. And what we didn't want is that if we did all our tests at room temperature or with high toughness, they would only the research would only be applicable to girders or steels that are tough, right, that are modern, not necessarily cold or, more importantly, old. As I said earlier in the presentation, prior to the, you know, the fracture control plan, we had no toughness requirements. So we have some steels and some bridges that are, I don't want to say they're bad or they're brittle, they just don't meet the modern specifications. And so they might be quite low in terms of their CVN energy, single digits, for example, at minus 30 Fahrenheit. We wanted all of our tests to reveal what is the absolute worst case, brittle steel, cold temperatures, so that we could apply it to the entire inventory without having to have caveats on, well, 
you need this toughness, so you'd have to go measure it, or, or it only works in South Texas. This way, we have the worst case, and we know that it works for all of the steels. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rob. We're going to wrap things up now, and uh, really appreciate appreciate you taking the time to uh, to give explanations to those questions. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.